Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. In the previous video, we used this figure right here to talk all about the RAS pathway. And just as a brief review, RAS stands for renin angiotensin aldosterone system, and it's a negative feedback loop that begins with low blood volume and low blood pressure, and through a series of processes which involve those three substances, renin, angiotensin II, and aldosterone, we can actually raise the blood volume and raise the blood pressure back to normal. And so this is a negative feedback loop because we have some initial stimulus and our outcome, the final outcome that is, is reversal of that original stimulus. So start with low blood pressure, end up with raised blood pressure back to normal. Here's another look at the RAS pathway. This really just simplifies it and shows the basic organs involved and the substances released by each organ. So again, remember that the kidneys release renin. The liver makes angiotensinogen, which is circulating in the blood. And then the renin is an enzyme that converts angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. And angiotensin 1 circulates through the bloodstream and eventually makes it to the lungs. The lungs contain an enzyme called angiotensin converting enzyme, also called ACE. And so ACE converts angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. Now angiotensin 2 has three functions. One is very generally it can bind to angiotensin receptors and promote vasoconstriction of arterioles throughout the vasculature. The second function is along those same lines, except it's specifically at the kidneys, where angiotensin II can bind to a similar receptor and promote vasoconstriction of the afferent arteriole. And what this allows is a reduction in glomerular filtration rate, because if our original stimulus is low blood volume, we certainly don't need the kidneys to be working in overdrive. We can certainly slow their action down, reduce the GFR, um, because we don't need to lose any more fluid. We're trying to raise up the fluid so that we get more blood pressure. Okay? And then the third function here is to act at the adrenal glands, specifically the adrenal cortex, to stimulate the release of aldosterone. Remember that, that's a steroid hormone. And aldosterone comes back to the kidney and acts at the level of the nephron, specifically the collecting ducts, where it promotes sodium and water retention and potassium and hydrogen ion excretion. And aldosterone is going to do this by acting at the cells of the collecting duct through the aldosterone receptor as shown right here. So once we understand the basic physiology, then we can come around and look at the various pharmacological treatments and see where in this pathway they target. The first drugs we'll look at are the ACE inhibitors. So recall that in this pathway, we have an enzyme in the lungs called angiotensin converting enzyme, which is ACE. And it's responsible for the conversion of angiotensin 1 into its active form, angiotensin 2. And ACE inhibitors inhibit this enzyme. So if you're inhibiting ACE, you're not going to have conversion of angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. And so what these drugs do is they decrease the amounts of angiotensin 2 and therefore also indirectly decrease the levels of aldosterone because aldosterone is released in response to angiotensin 2. But generally speaking, ACE inhibitors prevent the formation of angiotensin 2. And what might that do? Well, it would reduce the vasoconstriction in the peripheral vasculature, so that would actually decrease blood pressure, right? Uh, it would also decrease the afferent arterioles constriction, so it would be more in the direction of dilation, and that would actually increase the glomerular filtration rate. Because if somebody has high blood volume, and that's causing their high blood pressure, then we need to get the blood volume down. And so one of the ways is to increase the GFR by preventing that afferent arterial from becoming constricted, so more dilation. And then also by preventing the formation of angiotensin II, as we mentioned, you don't get as much aldosterone release. Okay? And so it also can act on the kidneys at that level as well. Now there's a quick way to tell if a drug is an ACE inhibitor, and that's if it ends in PRIL, P-R-I-L. So normally it's going to be some vowel, like an O or an E, and then it ends in PRIL. So look, lisinopril is very common, ramipril, benazapril, 
And so all of those have that same suffix, pril. And so that gives us a clue that this drug is an ACE inhibitor. Now because ACE inhibitors reduce the amounts of circulating angiotensin II, overall the kidneys are going to be more active. On one end, we are preventing that constriction of the afferent arterial, and so we may actually have a higher glomerular filtration rate. But also at the levels of the nephrons, we're also going to have more sodium and water excretion. Because normally aldosterone will promote sodium and water retention, but if we're not forming as much aldosterone, which is indirect, we're also going to be excreting that water. And so if somebody's high blood pressure is a result of high blood volume because they're retaining water, one way to lower the blood pressure is to lower the blood volume. And so by promoting more water excretion at the kidneys into the urine, we reduce the blood volume, and so that can be therapeutic. But of course, we may excrete too much fluid, and there may be some side effects like hypotension and dizziness, because if the blood volume gets lowered too much, then the blood pressure is going to get lowered too much, and of course that's going to cause dizziness, hypotension, and possible syncope, which would be fainting. The second drug class shown up here is the angiotensin receptor blocker, usually abbreviated ARB. Now, when angiotensin II functions, it of course has to bind to a receptor. Angiotensin II is a hormone, so it's going to bind to a receptor regardless of which tissue it's acting at. And so these receptor blockers are going to prevent angiotensin II from promoting vasoconstriction throughout the peripheral vasculature. Uh, if you can't have as much constriction throughout the peripheral vasculature, you're going to go more in the favor of dilation, which lowers blood pressure peripherally. Also, it's going to prevent that constriction at the afferent arterial. And also, it's going to prevent the release of aldosterone since angiotensin II is required binding to its receptor for aldosterone to be released. Now, angiotensin receptor blockers, uh, you can identify a drug like that because they end in sartan. So all of them are going to end in sartan, low sartan. Azelsartan, candesartan. When you see that suffix, that means you're dealing with an angiotensin receptor blocker. And like the ACE inhibitors, we also have to worry about hypotension, and with the hypotension, also syncope, fainting, falls, things like that. And generally speaking, angiotensin receptor blockers are not used in conjunction with an ACE inhibitor and vice versa. So if a patient's on an ACE inhibitor, they can be on other blood pressure drugs, but generally one of those is not going to be an angiotensin receptor blocker, and the reverse is also true. Okay. Now the third type of drug that we have is what's called an aldosterone antagonist or aldosterone receptor blocker. We didn't mention this before, but of course aldosterone is a hormone, and so in order to exert its effects, it's got to bind to a receptor, and that's this one right here, just aldosterone receptor. And so if we have a drug that binds to that receptor and competes with aldosterone, so basically prevents aldosterone from binding, then of course aldosterone can't exert its effects. Now aldosterone's major effects are at the kidney level, as we've talked about, so at the level of the collecting duct. So when aldosterone's functioning normally, it will promote sodium and water retention, so holding onto sodium and water to raise blood pressure, and also potassium and hydrogen ion excretion. So if we antagonize this receptor, then we're going to prevent that sodium and water retention in the favor of sodium and water excretion. Now, this can also cause the opposite for potassium. It can cause potassium retention. And so one of the side effects with aldosterone receptor blockers we have to look out for is hyperkalemia. Because if we're excessively preventing the excretion of potassium, potassium levels can build up in the blood. And potassium can play havoc with the heart's conduction system. So we need to watch out for that. But generally speaking, aldosterone receptor blockers are going to promote sodium and water excretion. Okay? Because aldosterone is no longer able to bind to its receptor. And two examples of aldosterone receptor blockers are spironolactone and this other drug called Inspra. Uh, and the chemical name is eplerinone. Okay, so these are three drugs that act at the level of the RAS system, whether it's through angiotensin converting enzyme or the receptors for aldosterone and angiotensin II. In the next video, 
we're going to actually look at the level of the nephron loop and see four classes of drugs that affect some part of the nephron loop to help decrease blood volume and also therefore decrease blood pressure. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the three classes of drugs that act at the level of the RAS system. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.